We are very excited to be speaking with Mr. Morris and Mr. Benz from the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives and very honored that they reached out to our district to have this conversation with our students. Um, it's a, it was a very interesting um, contest in that they were only two known images of Frederick Douglass's wife, Anna Murray Douglass. So um, the challenge for the Rochester area student to enter the contest was to depict um, Anna Murray Douglas as she may have appeared at different points during her life. And um, two of our students um, won awards in this contest. Holy Kim uh, won first place and Nina Stevens won third place. Um, and then some uh, banners were also made of some of the artwork to hang at the Frederick Douglass Family Initiative headquarters downtown. And um, paintings by Amy Zhao, Holy Kim, and Danielle Strauss were made into those banners. So congratulations to all who participated and um, were recognized. Um, Superintendent Pira, if you'd like to start out with some welcomes and opening remarks. Thank you, Laurie. Um, wow, it's so amazing to, to be on this Zoom call. It's, it's definitely my favorite Zoom of the week, maybe the year, um, maybe the last year and a half. So the background behind me is actually the visual that's in the Menden High School hallway of the banners of the pictures, um, of the, the drawings from, from all the students. And it's absolutely remarkable. The, the collaboration between the art department and our students with the Frederick Douglass Family Initiative aligns beautifully with both organizations' missions. And I have to thank the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives for all of their work and for inviting our school community to be part of uh, your efforts. Um, for the students that are on here, I, I can't tell you how proud um, I am of, of each of you. Uh, I don't know how the judges selected um, the places, uh, but I will tell you uh, that each one uh, in my mind was, was, was worthy of first place um, because of your effort alone. And, and I really wanna thank all of the students that are here who participated Certainly a special congratulations to Holy and Mina, um, but all of you have used your incredible gifts and artistry to make Menden High School a better place. And I think that's a, a really cool thought, um, how we can use um, art uh, as a vehicle to promote um, what we think is, is um, the best way to move our school district, our county, um, our community, and our world in a better place. And, and I absolutely adore um, and appreciate uh, everything that, that each of you did. It's nothing short of spectacular. And then last, I just, I wanna thank Sarah. Um, I wanna thank the art department, uh, Menden High School administrators for championing such an authentic and important project. I couldn't be prouder of, of everyone that's involved. And a special thank you to Mr. Morris and Mr. Benz um, for, for being here and for giving our students this opportunity to um, really look at art from a lens of creativity and critical thinking uh, and involving historical perspectives. Uh, it, it's absolutely what we strive for and you nailed it with your project in, in such an um, amazing way. Uh, also uh, want to thank Mayor Corby uh, for being here. And I think it speaks volumes when we can say that the, the work that happened at Menden High School um, is supported by um, the, the, the village, uh, the town, the district, and well beyond. Um, each of you have something to be really proud of. Um, I have the utmost respect for everyone on the screen um, and want to thank you all uh, and, and also just share my apologies. Uh, we have a um, standing meeting at one o'clock uh, that lasts the entire day with every administrator. I pushed that to two o'clock today. Um, so at least I can thank you and, and congratulate you and see you. Um, but Specifically, I want, want to thank again the Frederick Douglass Family Initiative uh, for, for um, bringing this to light uh, and, and everything you stand for and allowing our kids to take part in this. Thank you all. Amazing. Well, Mayor Corby, uh, we'll move to you. Sure. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say I'm, I'm pleased to see that the Pittsburgh Central School District is maintaining its reputation as an extraordinary place 
uh, for artistic uh, creativity. Um, it was, I had a legendary teacher as an art student when I attended Pittsburgh schools, and I'm glad to see that same thing happening here today. I believe art is a field that really does bring people together. It exposes all of our humanity, and it's been shown again and again and again uh, the beneficial effects uh, on our society, our culture, and our community. I, I just wanted to share, in addition to being an artist myself, which is how I got in the field of architecture, um, the other thing I wanted to say is I'm also a history geek. And um, recently I wrote a little piece on the history of the Phoenix Hotel. And in sharing that on uh, social media, I learned a fact that I did not know until this week about Pittsburgh. I knew that Susan B. Anthony had many friends in the village and was here frequently to come to dinner and to speak in Pittsburgh Village. However, I did not know that Frederick Douglass uh, also came to Pittsburgh to speak, which is interesting because Pittsburgh at that time was a very small village, not like today. And yet there is an extraordinary uh, theme in the history of our community from the beginning of an interest in human rights and social causes. And uh, Mr. Douglas was invited here because there were several leaders in the village that were known abolitionists and also were known to be station masters on the Underground Railroad. Uh, he was invited to speak in the ballroom, which is on the third floor of the Phoenix Hotel. That's the, um, the third story of that brick building right at the four corners. However, what, what a sad part to the story was that um, some anti-abolitionists uh, got in, leased the building for a day and locked it. So when Mr. Douglas arrived in the village, uh, he couldn't get in the Phoenix Hotel. Fortunately, uh, one of the owners of the general store in town had a warehouse that was big and empty. And that's where uh, Mr. Douglas attracted the crowd and that's where the speech was, was held. So you really are part of a legacy here in the work that you're doing today. And I just took a peek around Mike Pirro's head to see the quality of what you've done. And I'm amazed. I'm absolutely amazed by what you've done. So congratulations to all. Um, really, really makes me proud of being a Pittsburgh resident. Thank you. Thank you so much for that um, little bit of history. That's really amazing. Uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce again, um, Sarah Zakowlik who will um, talk a little bit about the art project, um, how it impacted her students and how it ties into and brings to life some of our district's initiatives. So uh, the, the Pittsburgh Centric School District, um, one of the things that in their mission is to focus on providing authentic experiences for their students to learn from and also help them make connections to their own lives and then to their local and global community. And uh, the district has been strengthening its, uh, its initiatives, its key initiatives actually around diversity and um, equity and inclusion. And so when I saw this uh, opportunity for the Anna Marie Douglas Life and Portrait Contest, um, I thought, wow, this is a great um, way, a positive way um, for students to uh, learn more and have a deeper understanding of what's going on in the world around us and current events, and also um, look at the work of and research many artists that use um, in their subject matter work around diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, I also happen to be perfect timing because the students had just finished a, a unit on figure drawing and we were moving into learning about the portrait. And uh, my colleagues and some friends actually emailed me about this. And I'm like, oh, uh, we have to do this. So uh, it was a learning process for all of us. It was a very challenging um, type of contest because the students really had to be creative because they had very little to go on in terms of a reference to look at. Uh, and so each student had such a variety of outcomes. Uh, as their art teacher, I was really proud of them. I also thought it's just to point out, um, this is actually pointed out to me, it is the beginning of Women's History Month. So I also think that the timing of this uh, discussion is wonderful uh, and another way to pay tribute to Anna Marie Douglas. Thank you. 
Thanks, Mrs. Halleck, and thank you for your insight and leadership in getting our students involved in such an impactful project. Thanks. Uh, at, yeah. At this point, we will turn the discussion over to Mr. Morris and Mr. Benz uh, from the Frederick Douglass Family Initiative, who will offer a little bit of history, um, some reflections on our students' artwork, as well as some information about some of the current and ongoing work happening in our communities um, on behalf of the Frederick Douglass Family Initiative. So welcome, Mr. Morris. Thank you very much, Lori. It is my honor uh, to be with you all this afternoon, and I want to say hello to everyone, but give a special hello to, to the students. Um, you know, it's so wonderful to think about this idea that my great-great-great-grandmother, Anna Murray Douglas, was uh, represented in such beautiful uh, portraits, you know, on behalf of the family of Frederick and Anna Murray Douglas, I wanna say thank you um, to all of you for lifting up her life and legacy and for presenting her uh, so beautifully. I'm gonna talk about the history and talk about my ancestry, just so you can see the connection back to Frederick and to Anna Murray Douglas. And then I'll turn it over to Robert and he can talk about the inspiration behind the contest and, and why we decided to do this. As I was introduced, I am the great, great, great grandson of Frederick Douglass and I'm also the great, great grandson of Booker T. Washington. And every time I tell people of my relationship to my ancestors, not only is it a mouthful trying to say all of those greats, but it sometimes makes me feel like I'm far removed and you might be sitting there having a hard time trying to imagine what my connection is to Douglas and Washington. It's like trying to picture what a billion dollars looks like with so many zeros. But many people know a grandparent and some of you may have even known or know a great grandparent. And that's how close I feel to both of my ancestors because you see my great grandmother, Fanny Douglas, to whom I was very close, she lived to be 103 years old and she met Frederick Douglass when she was a little girl. She didn't know at the time that she was going to grow up and marry his grandson, Joseph, but that's what happened. And my aunt Portia, to whom I was also very close, lived to be 95 and she was Booker T. Washington's daughter. And I remember being a little boy and sitting on my great grandmother, Fanny Douglas's lap as she would tell me what it was like to know as she would call him the man with the great big white hair. And I remember sitting on my aunt Portia's knee and she would tell me firsthand stories about her father, Booker T. Washington. And when we started the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives in 2007, um, one of the first programs we did was in 2008, and it was called the Frederick Douglass Dialogues Tour. Tour, And we turned uh, to schools. And I remember that one of the first presentations uh, to a group of middle schoolers, they were all looking at me cross-eyed like, man, you were so far removed. And and what does all of this history have to do with our lives today? And why are you talking about these people that lived so long ago? And so I was trying to give them some context to how we're not that far removed when you consider the generations. And I had this thought that hands that actually touched the great Frederick Douglass and hands that touched the great Booker T. Washington also touched mine. So in a sense, even with all of those greats, I can say I stand one person away from each man I stand one person away from history, and I stand one person away from slavery. We're not that far removed from the history of slavery in this country when you consider the generations. And so I brought you some family photographs because I, I wanted to show you how close I am just through, through three photographs. But before I do that, the question that I get, I get a couple of questions from people in the community all the time. They'll, they'll ask, so you're related to Frederick Douglass and to Booker T. Washington? well, what do you do? <laughs> and they always follow that up with, and it better be good. So as you can imagine, there has been this kind of weight of expectation that I've carried uh, for most of my life, trying to step out of the shadow of these two great, great American heroes. And then the other question that I get is, so I know that Douglas and Washington weren't related to each other. How is it that you're related to both of them? Well, here's how it happened. It happened on my mother's side of the family. This is my grandparents' wedding day photo. And in the center, you see my grandmother, Nettie Hancock Washington, and she's Booker T. Washington's granddaughter. And on the left of the screen is my grandfather, Frederick Douglass III, and he's Frederick Douglass's great-grandson. 
my grandparents met in 1941 at Tuskegee Normal School and Institute, which is a school that Booker T. Washington founded in 1881 at the age of 25 years old. They happened to be on campus the same day. They were rushing across to get to the other side and literally bumped into each other. Didn't know that the other descended from an historic family and they fell in love at first sight and wound up getting married just three months later. And when my mom, Nettie Washington Douglas was born, she was the first person to unite the bloodlines of these historic families and she was an only child. So when I came along, I had the honor and privilege of being the first male to carry this dual lineage. Also in this picture is my grandmother's brother on the right of the screen, Booker T. Washington III. So the significance of this photo is, is you have Frederick Douglass III shaking hands with Booker T. Washington III and the families now are officially united. Now you see Frederick as an older man here. Sitting with him is his grandson, Joseph. And Joseph is my great grandfather. Now we know Frederick Douglass taught himself how to read and to write, but he also taught himself to play the violin. He was a, a good musician and he was also a great teacher. He taught his grandson, Joseph, how to play and Joseph became a concert violinist. He played all over the world he played in the White House on several occasions, and he was the first Black classical recording artist for the Victor Talking Machine Company. And for you students, that was the record company back in the day. In the next photo, you see Joseph as an older man. Sitting is my great-grandmother, Fanny Douglas, who lived to be 103 years old, and on her lap is my grandfather, Frederick Douglass III, and then his sister is also in the photograph. So remember I said, I'm going to, going to show you through three pictures, my connection right back to Frederick Douglass. So you see Joseph with Frederick Douglass, you see Joseph with my great grandmother, Fanny, and now you see me and my younger brother, Douglas Washington Morris with my great grandmother, Fanny. And she was about a hundred years old in, in that photograph. You know, it's funny because I just did a presentation for a group of students yesterday and I asked them, do you recognize anybody in, in the photo? And about half of them thought I was the younger one and, and half of them thought I was the older one. And then there was, <laughs> there was somebody that thought they were really funny and they said, yeah, that's Michael Jackson. <laughs> so I, um, I, you know, I am the one with the fro and I thought I was Michael Jackson. I wanted to be in the Jackson 5 so badly, but that dream of mine launched my, my first career, which was a singing career. So anyway. Let me, let me just talk a little bit about Anna Murray Douglas and then I'll turn it over to, to Robert since she's the subject and, and the reason that, that we're all here. Anna and Frederick met while he was enslaved as a teenage boy in Baltimore, Maryland. She was the first person in her family to be born free. And they meet at some point, we don't really know where exactly they met, but they did meet. And as they started to like each other and think about a, a potential future together, Anna was the first person to plant the seed of thought in Frederick's mind that you're not meant to be a slave for life, Frederick. Now you have to remember he had been born into slavery with the name Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey and he never knew freedom. And so if your enslaver is saying to you, you are my property, I own you, you are a slave for life, and if your federal government is saying it's legal to own you and illegal to teach you, you as an enslaved person are not going to think for yourself. And so it was really important that Anna planted that seed of thought in his mind that you're not meant to be a slave, Frederick, for life. And then as they're thinking about a future together, she said, Frederick, I don't want our children's father to be a slave. Had she not sold her personal belongings to help finance his escape, had she not sewn the sailor's disguise that he would wear, who knows if he would have had the courage or the wherewithal to run away. And had he not run away, we wouldn't have had the comp contributions of the great abolitionists and we would be sitting here a very different country today. And so Anna is a very important part of this story. There would be no Frederick Douglass without Anna Murray in his life. They were married for 44 years. They had five children together and 21 grandchildren. She was a conductor on the Underground Railroad and the Underground Railroad was a network of people, places and spaces working together to help freedom seekers get their freedom. And so out of their home in Rochester, New York, she helped to ferry hundreds of freedom seekers to their freedom in Canada. And so I am just as proud of her 
as I am a Frederick. She worked alongside him for those 44 years. She didn't work behind him. She worked alongside of him. And so this contest has been really inspiring for me because there are only two photographs of Anna that are known. Frederick Douglass was the most photographed American of the 19th century. He understood from a very early age, about three years after he'd escaped from slavery, that he could use this new technology that he would come of age with, photography, to help make his arguments for liberation and equality in addition to his oratory and his, and his writings. And so he was very strategic in the way that he went about pre presenting himself through imagery. He was working to counteract the, what was in the public consciousness about how the American public thought about enslaved people. You know, there, those that were pro-slavery would say things like, these are savages from Africa, they're better off in slavery, they're getting the Christian religion, they're getting some level of care, listen to the happy songs that they sing, making a group of people and other to justify, justify taking away their freedom, their inhum uh, inhumanity and exploiting them and brutalizing them. And so Frederick is now saying through photography, when you look at a photograph of me, you're not going to be able to deny that I'm a man worthy of freedom, worthy of citizenship. And he said, I never want to look like a happy, amiable fugitive slave. He was photographed more than President Lincoln, more than Ulysses S. Grant, and his only contemporaries in the world that were photographed more than he was were the British royal family. And so there are 168 known photographs of Frederick Douglass, but only two of Anna later in her life. So to see the students create and imagine what she would have looked like at different ages in her life, that just was so inspiring to me because it brought, these, these portraits brought her to life for me and just really touched my heart. So I thank each and every one of the students for using your passion, your creativity, and your talent to create these beautiful images of my great ancestor. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Robert. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. I, you know, I'll be, I'll be uh, pretty quick here. I just, I, I really want to make one point. Um, all of the work that we do in our organization, uh, we have, uh, we've been around since the year 2007. Um, our focus uh, initially was on human trafficking prevention. Um, we now came to Rochester to uh, help address the issue of racial inequity. Uh, and we do, we also do these legacy type projects every once in a while, but whatever part of our work um, uh, we're focusing on at that moment, we always want to tap into the uh, the talent and the ingenuity uh, and the brilliance of young people. Uh, but that is always easier said than done. It, we're a small organization. We don't have a huge megaphone, you know, uh, uh, to, to be able to reach a, as many young people as we ever want. We, we always want to be able to get to more young people so we can see more amazing um, you know, images like you all sent to us uh, during this contest. The key for us to be able to reach young people is always having um, an enthusiastic and an understanding uh, educator. So I want to thank Ms. Zakalik for really being the, um, the, the point of contact to allow us to um, to see all these great images. Uh, thank you. So Sarah, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. I know our students have some questions that they wanted to ask Mr. Morris and Mr. Benz. Um, so I, I know you have a list of their questions and their names. Um, so I will um, have you introduce our students and um, have them ask their questions. Okay. Um, so uh, the first student I'd like to introduce is Holy Kim, and she uh, was the first place award winner for this contest. And so I thought it would be appropriate for her to ask her first few questions. So let me uh, unmute you. I think I did that. Wait. There you go. Um, hello. 
Um, I wanted to ask Mr. Morris um, what you would want us to remember most about Frederick and Anna Douglas and how we can um, honor their um, legacy today. Well, thank you for that question, Holy, and congratulations on um, your winning portrait is just stunning and, and beautiful. You know, I think that when I think about my ancestors, you know, many people know about Frederick Douglass's story and, and even if they don't know things like he was the most photographed American of the 19th century, um, many people know that he taught himself to read and write. He was born into slavery, he escaped, he became an abolitionist and an advisor to President Lincoln. And then he became a statesman where he was the first African-American nominated for vice president of the United States, first African-American US Marshal, first African-American recorder of deeds in the District of Columbia, first African-American ambassador and council general to Haiti and first African-American to have a statue dedicated in his honor right there in Rochester. Um, and so these are the things that the public think about. And certainly Frederick Douglass belongs to everyone and his, his spirit lives in all of us. But I think what I want people to remember about Frederick and Anna um, is a Douglass family and how important the family was to the work that Frederick did. He wouldn't have been able to do the work. He wouldn't have been able to travel all over the world um, speaking out against slavery had he not had the support of Anna, but also um, their five children. They spent 25 years, the Douglas family did, in Rochester. It's a, their adopted hometown. It's where Frederick and Anna are buried at Mount Hope Cemetery. So Rochester was a very important place in, in the life of Frederick Douglass. And so what I want people to think about um, is the family and their contributions and, and learn more about that. You know, And we're working on some projects where we're going to be lifting up the family and teaching about you know, what the children did um, with regard to abolition and women's rights and, and just fighting against injustice in general. Frederick was born into slavery. He only saw his mother four or five times his whole life. He didn't know who his father was. It was presumed that his father was his enslaver. He had six brothers and sisters that he didn't know. He had been separated from them. They were like strangers to him. And so he was truly an orphan with no family, no home, and no country. But yet, in spite of all of that, he was able to rise up through education to and, and self-taught education, because as we know from our US history, it was illegal to teach an enslaved person to read and write. And so when he would eventually have a family of his own, he loved his family. He loved his children. He loved his grandchildren. He used to get down on all fours and give his grandchildren horseback rides and they would hold on to his hair as the reins. He would let his granddaughter braid his granddaughters braid his hair with colorful ribbons. And so if you can imagine this little boy that had no family having a family, it was really important to him. So I am thankful for the love and humility and compassion and forgiveness that my ancestors have passed down through the generation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next student I'd like to introduce is Natalie Sincota. Uh, Natalie, let's unmute you. Forgive me, there we go. There you go. Um, Hi there. Hi. My question was for um, both Mr. Benz and Mr. Morris. It was a kind of a two-part question. Um, I wanted to know what um, you were most excited about before fi fin uh, seeing all the finished artwork. And then once you did, what were you most surprised about when you see it all, saw it all? Great question. Why, Robert, why don't you take that first? You're on mute. I really didn't know what to expect uh, from, from the entries, uh, but what I was most excited about was how you all took a lot of effort to um, understand the historical connection to your uh, images. And uh, that, was, uh, that was the best part of it to me is that you weren't just drawing a picture, you were drawing a picture with meaning to it. 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo that. Um, I didn't have a lot of expectations other than I, I felt like what we were going to receive was going to be really good because everything that is infused with the spirit of Frederick and Anna always turns out to be great. So I knew that the portraits would be great and, and, and they were. Um, also, what I was impressed with was exactly what Robert said, the, the research that went into knowing or learning about who Anna was as a person, because she's really been pushed aside in history, mostly by male historians that, you know, really don't treat her with the respect and dignity that she deserves for a lot of reasons that we don't have time to go into right now. And so this idea that you took the time to learn more about her and who she was, and then you put that into your art, and then also even went so far as to caption your art and talk about the inspiration that uh, came behind it. I thought that that was very moving and I just absolutely loved it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. So we have uh, two more students, just so you know. Um, the next student is uh, Daniel Straw. Um, Danny, I'm going to unmute you. Let's see here, there we go. Hi, um, my question was, what keeps the Frederick Douglass family initiatives like running and what we can do in the future, such as fundraisers to help you continue to tell your story? That I think is one of the best questions that, that I've heard in a long time is what can you do to help <laughs> keep us running? Well, you know, our mission is to build strong children and to end systems of exploitation and oppression. And that comes from one of my favorite Frederick Douglass quotes. It's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And I would add to that broken women as well. So this idea that if you're going to address challenges and um, social justice issues, that working to build the next generation of leaders, um, not only is it, is, is it a short-term solution because you're working with young people and you guys are inspiring us, hopefully we're inspiring you, but also you're getting into your soul and into your heart, this idea for justice and equality for everyone. And as artists, um, we work with a, an artist by the name of Nicholas Smith. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's really talented um, he calls himself an artivist. Everything that he creates has some sort of uh, communication and message and social justice meaning. And, um, and we love working with him because he, he's so creative and, and you all are as, as well. And so you can use your, again, your creativity and your talent to address those issues that you're most passionate about. And I've had students tell me that they're passionate about fighting for the rights of women and girls. Uh, passionate about eradicating homelessness and po uh, poverty, uh, protecting the environment, gun rights legislation, whatever it is that you're passionate about, you can use your talent. And I'm sure that many of you are not just talented um, painters and, and sketchers and drawers, but probably some of you are musicians and singers because it all comes in one artistic package a lot of times. But um, use your talent to be able to communicate a message to your school, your community, in the same way that, that Frederick Douglass did. The importance of Frederick Douglass immediately after he escaped slavery was he was a survivor of this institution of slavery that could communicate the inhumanity of slavery in a way that nobody before him ever had because he was a gifted speaker. He was eloquent, he was charismatic, he was theatrical. And for the first time, the country was hearing from a firsthand account from somebody that could communicate it in a way that nobody before him had ever done. And that really helped to push the abolitionist movement forward in, in a big way. So you all can do the same thing. What are those things that you're passionate about and how can you use your art to be able to communicate to your community the necessity of um, co uh, coming together and collaborating and, and working on these issues of injustice and inequality? I, I think you do have a recommendation on on how maybe they could help, huh? Yeah, I was going to save that for the end, but um, yeah, no, this is a, as good a time as any. So on the screen, you're going to see our new logo, and Robert, you can jump in here as well. And this logo was really inspired by um, 
an image that was created many, many years ago by an artist friend of ours who's Irish. Um, his name is Jim Fitzpatrick, and he created an image of Che Guevara. Let me see if I can go backwards here. I don't know if you've seen in the le top left corner, this is an iconic image of the um, Argentine freedom fighter who fought for um, social justice in, in Cuba. And what artists have done is they've taken that original image that, that Jim created and they've run with it and created so many beautiful pieces um, that really keep his life and legacy and spirit alive. And so you can see just basically the same same visage, but just different um, ways of presenting him. And so what we would love to do is with our new logo, which you see here, we would like to take this image of Frederick Douglass was him as a younger man and imagine what this could look like through anything that you would want to create, you know, the colors that you might use to, to kind of do the same thing that, that has been done with, with the Che image that I just showed you. And Robert, go ahead and jump in because I know this is something that you're passionate about as well. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we created it in a, um, in, a, in, in a kind of basic way so that in, in the whole, uh, not just the face, it could be the, the words too, um, so that uh, people could create something new out of that logo and something that meant something that that was meaningful to them. So uh, uh, if you all are interested uh, in playing with that a little bit, we would we would love to um, be able to feature different versions of our logo in different places and uh, certainly give give credit to those who who help. And even better, so here we are going to um, launch an online store sometime in the near future. And then eventually when we get through COVID and we can interact in person again, our headquarters on Main Street, we want it to be an open space for um, you all to be able to come in and, and, and use that space in, in various ways. Um, there, there's enough room to do art exhibits, um, which I can see that would be great, but we're also going to have a store and what we would like to do is use some of your creations and the creations of other artists on the merchandise, on t-shirts, on um, you know, coffee cups. And then we would share royalties with, with, the, with you, with the artists that are uh, creating these images. So just a couple of ideas that we're throwing out your way that you can uh, think about. Wonderful, that's very exciting. Uh, wonderful thing to look forward to. Uh, and then the uh, last student who will be asking a question is Zoe Barnes. And Zoe, I'm going to unmute you. There you go. Um, hi. My questions are, do you think that Frederick Douglass's goals and ideas are still being upheld and implemented in Rochester and just America today? And then what more can the city and community do to further carry on his impact and goals? Like, what do you think we're lacking in the most that we need to work on? Every day that I wake up and, and every day that Robert and I sit down to talk about a new project idea or an initiative, we always ask the question, what would Frederick Douglass do or say if he were here today? And I think that's a good question. And I don't think that really anybody can say for sure what he would do or what he would say, but because his blood flows through my veins, I'll take some liberty and say that I think that he would be somewhat pleased to see that some progress has been made uh, in this country. We elected our first African-American president and most recently our first female vice president of color. They would see that as progress, but I also think that he and Anna and Booker T. Washington would also be disappointed that we still have so far to go to reach you know, a, a country that lives up to the ideals of, of the founding fathers. And that's always been the struggle. You know, there are these great ideals, but have we ever really lived up to those? Did we live up to that in slavery? We're talking about freedom, justice, and equality for all, but yet we're enslaving people of African descent on the blood-drenched soil of, of America. 
when we think about Frederick Douglass's words, and if you read his three best-selling autobiographies, his first was published in 1845. It's called The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. It became a bestseller. It sold 4,500 copies in the first three months of its release. You read those books, you read his thousands of articles and essays that he wrote in the North Star newspaper, which was published right there in Rochester. In fact, the Talman building still exists and you can go by that building and see a, a marker out front that um, indicates that the, the North Star newspaper was published in that location. You, you guys live in a great place. <laughs> so there's so much history um, where you are. But Frederick Douglass's words are as relevant today to the challenges that we're facing as they were all of those years ago. And we're facing some mighty challenges and struggles right now, there, there's no doubt. But imagine living at a time in the 19th century where your federal government said it's legal to own you and illegal to teach you. I think most people would run away from that and thank goodness Frederick Douglass and many others didn't, or again, we would be a very different country today. So when we think about his life and legacy, how can we use his examples of courage and um, struggle and sacrifice to address these social justice issues that, that we face today? And he's, he's really a great model for, for this, as are many other you know, heroes and heroines that, that came before us. I think history is important for a lot of reasons. I think it's most important because we need to know where we come from in order to know where we're headed. But history is not just about the past. It's also about the present and it's about the future. The more that you know where you come from and this idea that you stand on the shoulders and you walk in the shoes of those that came before you and the idea that each and every one of you has greatness flowing through your veins, just like I do. And if you know where you come from, you can better navigate yourself in the world in which we live today. And this also is beneficial for your future and our future and the future of the country. So I think that really looking at the life and, and legacy of Frederick Douglass and, and his examples and reading his words, you know, he had really three things as our, our scholar friend and board member David Blight likes to say, he had his voice, he had his pen, and he had his vote. You all have your voice, you have your, your keyboard. <laughs> Imagine you're not doing a whole lot of writing, but typing. And, and you will have your, your vote one day. And so these are things that are as um, relevant and applicable today as they were in the 19th century. Thank you. You're welcome. I know you had about three parts to that question. I don't know if in my long answer, I got to all of them. Was there anything that I missed? No, that was perfect. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Sarah, was that the conclusion of the questions that students had to ask? That is, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for asking such poignant questions. And Mr. Morris, this has been such an honor to have you here with us and uh, teaching us about the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives and also just making this opportunity available for students to learn more about Frederick Douglass and Anna Marie Douglass and the connections it's made to the world today. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you for everything that you've done. And on behalf of the Douglass family, thank you for everything that you and your colleagues do to build strong children. <laughs>